This is Everyday Wellness, a podcast dedicated to helping you achieve your health and wellness goals and provide practical strategies that you can use in your real life. And now here are your hosts, clinical health psychologist, Dr. Kelly Donahue and nurse practitioner, Cynthia Thurlow. Hey, hey, today we are thrilled and excited to have Jeremy Fox who is a licensed professional counselor and EMDR consultant and mentored by Dr. Ariel Schwartz. He's a mental health therapist specializing in trauma recovery. He graduated from the University of Colorado, Denver, go Denver with a bachelor's in psychology and from Colorado Christian University with a master's degree in mental health therapy. Welcome, Jeremy. Pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have the tables turned here. <laughs> I'm, we're not in the Fox Den. I'm not in my home territory. I'm with uh, Cynthia and Kelly. So there you, you go. You are, in, you are in a safe Warm and friendly environment, let me assure you. Let me assure Absolutely. you. And, it, and if you have not listened to my podcast with Jeremy, you need to. Um, as I mentioned to Jeremy off camera, uh, one of the things I was really impressed by was he was incredibly prepared and asked me about more than just intermittent fasting. So that's, you know, start like a total thumbs up in my book. So let's yeah, kind of so dive right in. <laughs> we, we have we have to hold up ourselves up to that standard now, Cynthia. I know. <laughs> well, I mean, as a therapist, it's important for me to look at the background of whoever I'm talking to. That's one of those soft skills that really translates well with podcasting I've discovered is like the treatment planning emphasis of therapy or of course of being a nurse, practitioner, physician's assistant, anything like that. You want to know a little bit about who you've got in there. You want to get their mm-hmm. history. You want to do stuff. I mean, it's important to me to come across as competent. So I'm not going to just be like, here's this one five minute clip from your TED talk. Let's talk about that for two hours. Um, Yes, then that does. And no criticism, because I'm always grateful Mm -hmm. when people ask me to be on their podcast, but I am multifunctional, multimodality. Yeah. There's more to me than just that. So Imagine that, right? I appreciate You're a that person. You that. I know. Right. <laughs> I'm not wow. a figure yeah, right. on YouTube. Exactly. Let's not objectify our heroes, people. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that on social media, isn't there? That's a huge discussion. Yes, there's an enormous amount of it. It, it people, it, it just really compresses our views of people mm-hmm. and it kind of creates a cult of personality. And we have to be careful about that on the motivational side of Twitter because it can be like people hold on to these gurus with these three points, right? Of like, go take a shower, go work out, eat meat. It's like there's oh there's a little gosh. more than that. Just a <laughs> yeah. little more, a little bit, a little bit. Yes. And I don't know if Kelly, Kelly's fairly new to Twitter. Um, I finally convinced her to jump on. I'm so excited to have her on there because I can like tag her and things. (laughs) Right. Um, But I I do find that there is sometimes this kind of pedantic, same message all the time. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm going to always talk about health topics, but it's not going to be the same exact message all the time. Like there are people that's all they do. And so you don't want to be a one trick pony, right? No, no. You've got to have some, some different facets there. I mean, people's, your personality has to shine through, especially in any kind of work where you're the product, where you're the Mm -hmm. healer and you're the, 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 like Mm -hmm. you said, multifunctional Mm -hmm. person. There was this whole wisecrack video, which that's a great YouTube channel, by the way, analyzing how the uh, Sunny Delight account posted that it was depressed and it, like it took on an actual uh, personality. And then another company was like, you okay, man. It's like to succeed now in the online space, it's like even these inanimate objects have to have personality. So wow. how much more so do people? It, well, yeah. I think you have to be clever. I think that's the one thing I've come to find out. Um, yeah. And you can't overthink things. I think a lot of people tend to overthink things. And uh, because of that, they, their content appears to be contrived. Ah, yes. Too scripted it becomes very phony and contrived. Absolutely. Well, before we go too far down this rabbit hole, I want to back yeah. up a little bit and find out a little bit more about who you are and how you got into this field. That's a great series of questions. <laughs> so I f- discovered that I loved psychology when I was in high school. So I enjoyed reading about Freud. It was around the time too that I was really studying Shakespeare. And I it struck me how literary the psychological field could be. 
uh, the emphasis on analysis, almost like textual analysis, right? Especially again with Freud and his, you know, whatever you view, whatever you think about him, because obviously everything he said was not completely accurate. He definitely put thought into things. We could say that. So I encountered a real love for psychoanalysis, uh, for classical psychology stuff, the theoretical modalities. So I knew I wanted to study that in college. So when I went into college at CU Denver, I discovered that I, I had kind of a split, a love for research, but also for obviously socializing and uh, taking psychology into the applied space. I didn't want to just do laboratory testing all day. I couldn't have done that. It would be far too isolating for my personality. You have a big personality. I can't imagine you in a lab. Well, you know, stifled. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's that's true. A and B kind of research can be so micro it can be a real micro focus. Um, the research I love is more counseling psychology research on subject human subjects versus like rat studies mm-hmm. and isolated stuff like that. So I thought, well, I really enjoy therapy. I would say that's a great applied space to go into. And I want to help people with the power of this academic discipline. So that's why I went into it is because it's something where I knew that I could have a passion for it. And um, I loved the medical field, didn't want to deal with blood and guts all day. So that's, again, kind of why I didn't pivot into that. But I really loved psychiatry. Psychiatry is such an interesting field now, though, because you can't, a lot of the time, you don't do therapy. With managed care the way it is, psychiatrists now, people still think psychiatrists are like in the days of Freud. And I have to set a lot of expectations about that when clients meet me they're like okay so i have you and a psychiatrist am i just going to be talking twice like yeah but it's going to be basic uh yeah it's going to be medication management and some basic check stuff a lot with the psychiatrist so it's a shame because they go through so much education and then a lot of the time it ends up just glorified pill swapping and stuff some of them are pushing back against that but yeah mm -hmm. well and unfortunately i mean in western medicine i mean that's a lot of what i grew tired of was Right. There, there's a time and a place, emergency medicine, you're in the mm-hmm. hospital, you've got an acute health crisis. Absolutely. But most preventative chronic health issues are managed with pill. It's so pill focused. And yet, right. you know, Kelly and I are, you know, and, and you as well, we're all doing work in this space and it's a lot more therapeutic. You know, there are other modalities, there's nutrition as a component, there's self-care. I mean, there's so many there's sleep so many components to, you know, having a healthy lifestyle that don't right. involve swapping pills. Uh, and so I, I love that you were able to distinguish what worked for you as opposed yeah. to what would not work for you. I always say if blood and guts are not your thing, then don't go the medical route <laughs> for sure. Well, it, you know, blood and blood is fine. It's some of the other fluids, <laughs> the ones that smell worse, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's that's no, really like I could watch horror movie. I am not squeamish about some stuff, but other stuff it's like, uh, you know, I'm out. So oh, I'm, I have to actually apologize to people. I probably have done this to Kelly more than once. And I'll just say, please stop me if I'm too far in depth. Cause I just nurses, we can talk about anything oh, while we're yeah. eating, while we're doing anything. We forget, like there was a time I was in the doctor's lounge and I was with some nurse practitioners and with some of the physicians in my practice. And the physicians at one point looked at the three of us and they were like, y'all are gross. Like we can't even talk about this while we're eating. I'm like, oh, we can talk about anything. So well, that, that just goes to show it. nurses really. I love nurses. I love nurse practitioners. I don't I, like, I personally go to a physician's assistant for my medical care and she does acupuncture. So I yeah, I love that. Kind of, but, but yeah, to go, you have to be, have a strong stomach. And again, like I can hear about it or talk about it almost any time, but it's, Again, certain certain stuff, you know. Sure. But it's good to figure out what works yeah. well for you and what doesn't, right? It is, yes. So if you want me to go into kind of how I got into trauma in particular after my grad, yeah. So yeah, yeah please. That. So addictions is a field that just to kind of really quick address this, addictions is a field that requires therapists who have a lot of patients. And I do on a lot. Addictions also requires a really strong resolve and resilience and belief that people will come through after a lot of relapse. Um, and not always, 
but sometimes. So that's a, that's a great subdivision of the field. The reason I went more into trauma is because I had a good mentor. Uh, my EMDR instructor, Julie Green from the Clear Mind Institute, I think she's retired now. We've, st- we've stayed in touch, but um, I, I had a good deal on EMDR training, thankfully working at a nonprofit at the time. Uh, got a discount on it, but I wanted, whether or not I got that, I was going to do EMDR training. I'd heard so much about eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing the therapy that addresses trauma that Francine Shapiro came up with. Um, and I had just been told you need to get trained this and you get, you'll, you'll love it. Um, I did. And that's really when I went into trauma therapy, seeing what that can do for people. And just from there on, it was like, okay, so looking at a lot of mental health stuff as law trauma or loss, it just underlies over 90% of mental health issues. I think some facet of trauma or loss. Totally. Totally. Um, as a fellow EMDR trained person, woo woo, high five. Um, (laughs) I I think one of the things that I was surprised to learn was that trauma can take a lot of different forms. And in my training, I learned that there's trauma with a capital T, which are sort of the traumas that we all think of, like a horrific child abuse experience or seeing terrible things in war repeatedly. There are also traumas with a little T that can be just as impactful. Can you talk about that, please? A hundred percent. So I love that delineation there. I, 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 every time I get a new client and they're referred for some kind of a past event or something that causes some self-esteem issues, I set that stage. I explain, well, here's what EMDRs are like, well, I'm seeing that this is for trauma and I've heard about it and I don't know if I qualify. And I say, you know, whatever developmentally impedes us or whatever turns out to be a touchstone moment that we go back to or we remember in fear when we're going to do something, that's a trauma. It doesn't have to be sexual assault, fear for your life in wartime. It can be being lost somewhere from a parent and thinking that you're you're going to be hurt. It can be, uh, what I see a lot is it can be st- someone who's stuck in a very developmentally inappropriate and dismissive environment growing up where you have parents who don't teach you how to handle emotions. You have a uh, constant, constant dismiss dismissal of your own needs. A lot of chronic childhood stuff and misattunement from parents, like parents who don't dignify the child's emotions or shame them for Mm -hmm. anything. Chronic shame Mm -hmm. is one of the biggest problems that I find in, 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 in my client base. And that's a tough one. Thankfully, EMDR does really well with that. But some of those lowercase T traumas can involve things like being shamed with stage fright or Mm -hmm. um, some kind of experiences where you were publicly shamed in school, either in high school, middle school, things people think, ah, it's not a big deal, but that get in the way of dating or forging relationships because they, they view that as it's, it's like an unupdated version of the self. It's like a, a version of the self. It's an ego state, right? And we can get into what that is, but it's like a save state that hasn't updated to your particular state now as an adult. It's when people feel yep. kind of small. That's usually linked to some kind of a traumatic event. And that makes complete sense. I mean, I before we got on air, we were touching base on this a little bit and, and Kelly helped me kind of work through this earlier this year with me being hospitalized uh, and being in the hospital. And, you know, it, there's nothing worse than being a healthcare provider and being hospitalized because the... The, the thought process is you're going to have every unexpected complication and then some. So 13 days right. hospitalized, had a surgery six weeks after I was I was released. And I remember the day that they decided to not do an outpatient surgery. They wanted to do it inpatient. And it triggered me in the worst way. I cried. The poor nurse on the mm-hmm. phone, I started to cry. I was like, I can't be admitted again. And Kelly was like, maybe there's some underlying trauma. Maybe you have some mild PTSD from your experiences there, because let's be honest, being hospitalized is not fun. Um, And so what are some of the things that you do when people have a a more, obviously I've evolved beyond that. And now I, I recognize for what it is, but when you're working with people, do you start automatically with EMDR or there are other modalities that you use in therapeutic communication to help people kind of process their traumas? Right. So that's a good question. I want to add in here another good definition for if you, if, if something is traumatic. So 
if if both of you have heard or either of you have heard of Bessel van der Kolk and his book, The Body Keeps the Score. Okay, so Kelly's nodding Such her head. It's a good book. Yeah. Yes. So I recommend that book to anyone. Here's the deal. I had a client tell me, and I have since amended that recommendation. There are some stories in there. If you're not ready to read about that or it could be triggering for you, then look up a summary of it at least. It's such a great book. I, I, I wouldn't want to throw the baby out the bathroom. There is talk about trauma in there, obviously, but there's so much talk about healing mm-hmm. and about the modalities there. So I can segue into that. So, so Bessel talks about the fact that isol- so a, an immobilization Mm-hmm. Immobilization is the core of most trauma. If there's anything to take away from my, my discussions about trauma, it's that. Because if you feel that you can't get away from something or you're mm-hmm. cornered, like being in the hospital, being yep. a captive, mm-hmm. okay, yep. in, in <laughs> yes. so many words. Right. <laughs> 13 that, days, yep. Right. So that is a core element of trauma of because, because our response, we want to flee something. We want to have choice. We want to have that internal locus of control, we'd call it, and be able to determine our own actions at a very primal level. And if we feel that our exit is cut off, we feel cornered like an animal, then our kind of mammalian sympathetic response will jump in and it it, it can form a sort of memory that we go back to and we want to resolve, right? So to segue into what I do for clients with that, EMDR is a whole modality. It's not just the eye movement. It's from start to finish the treatment planning, preparation stage, desensitization, reprocessing, closure, reassessment. All of that stuff is entailed in it. So, it, I'm, and you can kind of swing back and forth between planning for desensitization and just doing some other, like preparation stage encompasses a lot. So I will spend time in that depending on how severe the trauma. So, and, and that's a great way to look at it as, if someone has some complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is usually forged in a chronically abusive childhood environment and it's real attachment trauma based, setting that stage of trust and having quite a few sessions where I teach them breathing exercises to slow the breathing during sympathetic nervous mm-hmm. system and limbic system arousal, okay? Yeah. Setting the stage with those kind of preparatory exercises is going to be key. Uh, if someone has a form of trauma where they generally have a really good self-efficacy, self-esteem, but they just got knocked by something and they feel insecure about it and it's kind of a this one-time event, then I'll usually jump into EMDR after some basic prep work because they have that foundation mm-hmm. of self-esteem, of safety, mm-hmm. of knowing that they're going home to a, an environment that's that's validating. Like if they have friendship, like that just says, okay, Let's leap into taking out that negative event because you're ready for it. Um, for the for the small so for smaller stuff, I will usually go into treating it as an EMDR target, getting the the thoughts, emotions, body sensations, all that stuff related to the event, um, reprocessing it so that the brain knows they're here, they're safe. So obviously, the bilateral stimulation is involved, and they're they're reprocessing it. It orients the brain to the fact that they're here, they're safe, they did it. Right. And there's that working memory hypothesis of EMDR that adding the bilateral eye movement stimulation while you're thinking of the traumatic event, like being stuck in the hospital, Mm -hmm. tells their it taxes that working memory enough that they still remember it, but it takes the emotion out because they can't Mm -hmm. hold all that in mind. Okay. So I'll usually go into targeting individual events like that if it's a more minor lowercase t trauma. But if they don't even need that, if it's not intrusive enough, they don't want to do EMDR for whatever reason which that's, that would be pretty rare, but let's say other tools in the toolbox would be uh, teaching paired relaxation and somatic, or excuse me, somatic relaxation and cognitive restructuring. So having them think, I'm he- um, this is what's coming up. So it would be like thinking of this hospital visit, but I survived it, <sighs> breathing. So that's like DBT, a dialectical mm-hmm. behavior therapy skill. So I'll lean heavily into DBT as well. And for the audience, I really recommend further reading on that. Marsha Linehan is a prolific author. She had borderline personality disorder and then wrote this whole curriculum for people who have it. So she overcame that, which it's a very pernicious personality disorder that involves a lot of attachment trauma, just to not go into too much detail. It's so the fact that someone wrote something, a whole curriculum that really helps with it. It's amazing. So it involves a lot of 
dialectics or recognizing you're here and safe, but you want to change something. It's seeming opposites that you combine. So that's a big thing too, is to honor your experience with the trauma, whatever happened, but also recognize you're safe. A lot of bottom up work. So from the body to the brain is what I'll do with any kind of traumatic event. Teach people that they can rewrite the event and say like, okay, I got out of it. Here's what happened. You can go through that narrative with someone when they're in the safety of my office, a therapist's office or any safe practitioner's office, and they recognize this is over. So that's a way to do it too. Yeah. One of the valuable things, and you've said so much good stuff there. I'm trying to keep track of all the things I <laughs> no, want to I, Yeah, say. that's how I do. I, that's how <laughs> no, I am with awesome. clients. It's <laughs> awesome. It's like stream of consciousness. It's all out. <laughs> but one of the things that I found that my clients find really useful is when, and I'm guessing you do this in sort of these preparatory phases, when you do some education and you explain the neurobiological, the neurochemistry yes. of trauma, right? And 100%. so could you talk a little bit more about that and kind of like dig into the stress response and how the, these memories sort of get stuck because we're in the stress response? Yeah, I, that's, that's really exciting stuff for me. And I, I put it in a way that clients, no matter their familiarity with the body or not, I mean, I'll get them educated in that stuff because it's funny how we learn so much stuff in school or even in grad school, right? Not all of it relates to stuff. I learned a lot of it post-grad. Now, my grad school, CCU, did a great job. They had like a whole crisis and trauma course that was really in-depth. It's part of the reason I went there is they had some good core. They even had some great electives on like neurofeedback, stuff like that, which again, helps learning the parts of the brain. So there are really two, there, there's some authors that I love to talk about on this stuff. Bessel van der Kolk is one of them. Um, Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S is the other. So for everyone out there, if you just Google polyvagal theory, P-O-L-Y-V-A-G-A-L theory, um, it, it is a huge, huge modality. It's a huge way of looking at trauma that I ascribe to. So to go into that more, we have this, this nerve, the vagus nerve, okay? V-A-G-A-S. So it's amazingly thick. It's like the 10th cranial nerve. It goes all the way down through our face, through our throat, our stomach, through our body and connects at all these points and responds to stress. So we have different branches of that vagus nerve. We have the ventral vagal branch, which is connected to like our social engagement response. So when we're trying to talk things out, when we're stressed with someone, okay, that's that highest evolutionary branch. And when we feel more stressed about something, we go into sympathetic nervous system arousal, okay? Mm -hmm. So that involves heart rate going up. It involves kind of trying to fight or flee. And that's, a, that's that hyper arousal that people go into with trauma of feeling like they need to escape or they're trapped or whatever. And that's where I, I lean heavily into that because a lot of clients struggle with it. Like, why am I getting anxiety? Why am I feeling this way when I'm thinking that I'm safe? That mm -hmm. dichotomy of nervous system arousal versus cognitive knowledge is big. So I linger a lot on the sympathetic nervous system response, okay? And the limbic system arousal. So the limbic system involves the, it's subcortical, it's deeper in the brain, okay? It is reptile the, brain. It is, yeah. There's that. There's well, limbic system. I think a lot of times it's called the mammalian brain. It mm -hmm. goes into like the, the reptile brain gets into the uh, reticular formation, all the stuff that's very primal. We'll we'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> but yes, no, that's very that's a that's a that's a great point. Um, the limbic system involves the amygdala, right, which is that little almond shaped structure that can cause so much so much. <laughs> trouble. <laughs> oh, it, it serves us well, but it be can become overactivated like a smoke detector that needs its batteries changed. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like beep, that. Beep, 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 beep. I, yeah, I use that metaphor a lot because you want a smoke detector. Mm -hmm. You want to know that there's fire, but if you there's a little puff of smoke and it was from you cooking and you have to deal with the smoke detector, that causes more stress than it's worth, right? You knew that there was some smoke. It's like, no, that, that, no, I don't need that now. Thank you. I'm my, my ears. Oh my God. That's, but that's what uh, traumatic anxiety is like, right? It comes up, your body's trying to protect you from stuff that you already know is okay, but on that primal level. So to get into how those memories are stuck, when someone is very hyper aroused in their body and they're 
when their heart rate goes up, when they're releasing cortisol, when they're extremely stressed, memories can be encoded in a very state dependent, so bodily, somatic dependent form. Okay, state dependent memory we talk about a lot in traumatology. It involves memories that, uh, if you they're cued by whatever sensory form, so sight, smell, touch, whatever they were stored in. So that's stories of people who were sexually assaulted, and then when a lover who they're consenting to be with touches them, they can still freeze up, freaks them out, and the lover. It's like that's a state dependent memory. Okay, they're remembering that they were touched in a way that was invasive, and it's that very touch that sets it off. The memory is not stored in a narrative capacity because that arousal, that cocktail of limbic system arousal, that amygdala, the fear center of the brain being activated rather than the prefrontal cortex, the rational side, and the sympathetic nervous system causes the memory to not be stored in a narrative, semantic, uh, episodic form, whatever you want to add there, and to be stored in a state dependent form because that level of stress when the event was happening. So I teach people that. So how to get through that is to notice those somatic physical sensations, target those with EMDR or with paired relaxation, breathing, whatever you can do. Any desensitization therapy is great for that because you're reclaiming your physiological response. You're reclaiming your body's response to the stuff you're recognizing okay, this is like a smoke detector. I can breathe through this. I'm not dying now. I'm okay. And so you're injecting some of that rational prefrontal cortex. You're processing it that way when it wasn't encoded that way. And EMDR is helpful for that because it titrates. So it turns into a, a digestible dose, that trauma, and you're like feeding it back through your brain, through the frontal cortex and storing it in that way that puts it in its proper place in history, literally, in the past. Hi all, it's Kelly. As you probably know, Cynthia and I love eating healthy. We are also busy moms and entrepreneurs who don't always have time to shop for the best ingredients. If like us, you're trying to eat clean, but you don't necessarily have the time to go out shopping and deal with crowds and even search for the best organic foods, we have a solution for you. What if you could easily pick out the best ingredients online and have the meal delivered right to your door? You can with Sunbasket. Cynthia and I both rely on Sunbasket at various times when our life gets busy to help us provide good, high quality meals for our family. With Sunbasket, you can cook healthy, delicious dinners with organic produce, premium ingredients, and delicious flavors that are delivered right to your door. All you have to do is choose your desired meal plan, and there are a lot of different meal plans to choose from, including the gluten-free plan, which Cynthia and I use regularly. You can customize it the way you want it, and you can have all the ingredients in your recipe ready to go. Sunbasket has organic produce, clean products, and they're a proud certified organic handler. So if you want to put your meal planning on autopilot to eat well all week, visit our link in the description to get started with Sunbasket today. That was so such that, a good explanation. And I, and I, I think appreciate it. I, yeah. I tell it a lot. I go through this stuff several times a week. So let me really quickly revisit polyvagal stuff. So you've got like the, the um, social engagement, which is, uh, and you can kind of think about it based on from top to bottom through your brain, right? Your facial expressions are that social engagement response. You go lower into your chest and that's the fight or flight response. Then you, and that's ventral vagal dorsal, or excuse me, that's the ventral vagal uh, branch. And then you have the dorsal vagal response, which is the freeze, the <laughs> like evacuating your body, your bowels, the, maybe vomiting, the, the, that kind of response that's really damaging that we would think of as the lowest form that's reptilian response of freezing that gets into that branch mm -hmm. cynthia that we were talking about the reptile brain it's very primal some people with complex ptsd have been exposed so much to trauma that they never, never developed that social engagement response they have an unmyelinated vagus nerve so it's not built up as much they didn't have that attunement with a parental figure when they were younger, and you can rebuild that, you can remyelinate the nerve with therapy. That's why it's so important. But to people with trauma and and others, but um, the the dorsal vagal response is freezing and just 
saving your body's metabolism. It's immobilizing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if someone it freezes during a sexual assault or any kind of, that's a common one. I go back to that a lot because I, I deal with a lot of survivors from that. Unfortunately, I, I wish it wasn't as common, but um, if someone freezes and their body betrays them and they, they're taken advantage of in the midst of freezing, there's shame there because they wish they could have done something and there's the trauma. So to everybody listening, it's a very common response to be like, why didn't I fight back? Because your body was conserving its energy and maybe you have a history of freezing and dropping into that lower uh, vagal nerve response versus social engagement or fighting. So that's one of the biggest things I talk to clients about is the freeze response, because we hear about fight or flight. Freeze is just as relevant because it happens quite a lot. No, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I want to pivot a little bit. And, you know, when I think about shame, not only personally, professionally within society, I think a lot about the work that Brene Brown is doing. And so I'm curious to know if you kind of integrate some of her principles, because for me, growing up Catholic, Mm -hmm. uh, you can be well assured that there's like shame that go, I have to fight against every day because it's just so embedded in, in the culture that, that I grew up in and having an Italian mother who to this day, even though I'm in my forties still will, you know, lovingly shame. I thought me you were 29. Me. Oh, aren't you sweet? So this is He's just, like he wants me. to come back again. I think. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so for me, reading her work has been profoundly transformational for me personally. I'm curious to know what you think about her work or, you know, maybe it's, it's a little less technical than the, than the work that you're doing with your patients, but I'm, I'm just curious what you think of it. And, and oh, absolutely. Yeah. Brene Brown's great. Her Ted talk's awesome. She's is. made this stuff so relevant to people and, and applicable. Uh, I have nothing but praise for her stuff. You know, the gift of imperfection has been a big book in the therapist world for yeah. a while, even before daring to to lead or, or daring greatly, things like that. Um, she has a whole curriculum now that therapists can get trained in. So I think that the that is that's a great pivot point to talk about shame. I do incorporate a lot of her principles into EMDR. So for instance, for listeners out there. E the EMDR modality starts off with prep. You learn to put negative stuff in a, in a mental box to be able to state change, which means go into a positive state, think about a safe place. And then when you start desensitizing stuff, you think of the negative cognition that's related to the event that you're desensitizing with the bilateral eye movement. So a negative thought will be something like, I'm unworthy, I'm dirty, I'm worthless, right? Those are very common. So that's shame. So I do a lot of shame targeting. And then people will come up with memories of, oh, wait, here's a time where I felt worthy. Here's a time where people often connect their memories during EMDR sessions. And then we explicitly uh, integrate, we install positive thoughts in the back end in the installation phase. So it'll be something like, I survived this. I have a choice now. I'm free. I did the best I could. Very, very part and parcel kind of typical EMDR thoughts there that we install. Um, that's how I use a lot of it. I will refer clients to her books. I'm not absolutely the most versed Brene Brown fan. I have watched her TED Talks and I love a lot of that. And I, I use a lot of shame uh, psychoeducation with clients, I'll explain like shame actually makes stuff worse because you can't fight trauma with shame. Like well, people will get upset at themselves for still being traumatized. So it's this feedback loop of mm. trying to fight a negative with a negative. Yeah. It just compounds the negativity. If you, here's another one, people will often be ashamed for their anger responses. Well, that shame makes them angry at themselves, which makes yeah. them snap more <laughs> at others, which makes, so that's so where true. I go. Totally. Yeah. 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 So I tell people you have to in introduce a lot of self-compassion. I go into that route, but you know, Tara Brack, Brack, yes. B-R-A-C-H. She's awesome. Her self-compassion works. I think she's really releasing a new book here shortly too. Because a client of mine was talking about her, and I'm like, oh, yeah. And we looked it up, and I'm like, oh, I think that is going to come out soon. So anyway, uh, a lot of great authors are now writing about shame and the converse of that, of, of self-compassion. So I think that's a great direction to go. It's sad because a lot of people who it's – it's the paradox, right? People who need the most confidence are the ones out there not looking at it. They're the ones who don't think that they deserve it. 
Mm-hmm. It's like right. a, this, this in trauma is really like this infection that is an autoimmune infection where it like affects the way we perceive ourselves. Yeah. So I think that's and I so think important. just the, the psychoeducation that you do, the time that you spend with people really talking about the biological basis of this, I think that Mm -hmm. that in and of itself helps a person to come out of that shame a bit because they can see that this is not just them. This is not a personal defect. It's not that there's something wrong with them or that they're bad. There are mechanisms that are Mm -hmm. protective and that's what sets this up. And there's a way to undo it too. And I think, you know, it's always interesting for me because you're both clinical psychologists listening to you both. Uh, you know, when I talk to my patients about neuroplasticity and how I remind them, I'm like, your, your, your internal dialogue is so critical. So I even catch myself doing it. Like I'm judging myself. I'm like, wait a minute, stop. And I, it's like, okay, what's the different narrative I can do? So a lot of that I do with my patients who will call themselves bad. I made bad choices. I'm like, wait a minute, let's back it up. You chose to eat X And, you know, tomorrow is a new day. Give yourself some grace, give yourself some compassion because we are so good at judging ourselves and judging other people. And I'm like, that's just the wrong kind of veil or mindset as we're kind of looking out on the world. And that's just, that's me as an NP and a human. Um, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I love listening to how you approach these different issues. It's fascinating. Yeah, I appreciate that. My background is an LPC, is a licensed professional counselor. So I, you know, I had the research experience, some of it. I have, I didn't do a thesis. I'm working on an EMDR paper, which is in revision and going to be sent back to the EMDRIA International. So that's the EMDR International Association Journal. So be on the lookout for that. But um, absolutely, yeah, that'll be fun. Um, I think that here, here's something. You know how eggs, how eggs would change from year to year on that you can eat them. Oh no, it's bad cholesterol. It's not correct. Yeah. Okay. It's different dogma, different years. Yeah. Yep. Similar so with was, coffee and all those other things yeah. too. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yes. Meat. Yeah. That's how it was with neuroplastic. Well, not exactly, but there was this, this narrative of, well, you stop growing new neurons, you stop building connections, you stop this in adulthood. That was so ridiculous because we've learned that that's not true. Life is not static. Our bodies are not static. Right. Yeah. One thing that Freud, you know, I love for, that Freud spent time on the past. I, I love that. But one thing that he really oversimplified, and we can get into a lot of that, and we can also get, uh, get into <laughs> the misogyny elements. But one thing is like that the personality is forged by five years old or that it's just things like that where people can take that and like the elements yeah maybe some core things like you you learn to like for one I love Eric Erickson's stage it's psychosocial stages yeah. of development because it goes through the whole lifespan by the way mm-hmm. yeah by age 5 you you've kind of been taught some things about you know you've been either celebrated and taught to kind of explore and have that safe place or not but you're, there's still so much rewiring that can be done. Absolutely. Yeah. I like to think of it as an operating system for your computer. So between zero and eight, zero and 10, you're given this operating system. And during those years, you don't know that another operating system exists. You don't <laughs> even know that there are other brands out there mm-hmm. and you can carry that into life and continue to use that operating system to view the world, which could mean the beliefs that you have about yourself and your worthiness and all of that kind of stuff. But the great thing is there comes updates every so often where we can update the software. And I think Mm -hmm. that what you're talking about here is that EMDR and the type of somatic therapies that you can get into, that's Mm -hmm. really a tool to update that software. Yes, it is. And I love that metaphor because that's the software and we got to take care of the hardware and that's where <laughs> Cynthia comes in. We got to make sure that we've got the the RAM there. We've got we've got enough sleep so that we can have the RAM, the mental mm-hmm. processing speed after after sleeping. Uh, oh my gosh, that's a great that is such a great metaphor for it, the operating system. Isn't that amazing? I don't think I've ever heard you say that before, Kelly. That is brilliant. Oh, yeah, I don't think I've I said must that. Say. Yeah. Breaking new ground here. <laughs> All right. right. You heard podcast. it here first, right That's here. Right. Yeah. You know, nobody <laughs> steal that. Give credit. <laughs> Kelly I wanna, Yeah. I want to shift a little bit and talk about social media. And ah. obviously, I'm everywhere uh, because I run a business, as many of us are. And so let's talk about the impact of social media on mental health, because I think that's really critical. And 
I, I would imagine that there are certain personalities that thrive better and with that kind of influence. And certainly my generation, I'm not dating myself, of course, but my generation didn't grow up with social media. You know, social media is kind of a newer construct for me, but I look at my children and I look at younger generations and that's all they've ever known. You know, their whole world is under the construct of, you know, everything they do every day is on social media, you know, from right. the benign to not so benign. And so, you know, as mental health specialists, you know, how do you see that impacting people in positive and negative ways? Mm, you want to go first, Kelly? I can pivot off your... No, you are the guest. This is <laughs> all you. Guest. You, you go. Okay. You lead. All right. So I'm going to give a book referral for this too, and then we'll get into it. So I love that you uh, give book referrals because it because Kelly and I are both, pardon me, Kelly, we're both nerds and we'd love to read. So well, you could say I'm you're proud. bibliophiles. Good. We are Just bibliophiles, but I always uh, like to say I appreciate when guests are well-read as well. So I yeah. just wanted to give a little, a little prop there. Well, thank you. So, <laughs> the, and I do this with clients. I'll tell clients like, I have some who really like to hit up the library so they don't even have to buy the stuff. They can just write it down. It's like, what a time to be alive. There you go. That's one good thing about technology now. Mm -hmm. So um, the book iGen, lowercase i, uppercase G-E-N, obviously it's it's like a play on iPod, iPhone, whatever, but it's iGen, like iGeneration, mm -hmm. okay, by Gene Twinge. It is a great book on this, this conundrum that we're talking about of social media's impact on younger people all the way through millennials, which kind of, that's a big cohort. Um, the age spans from now like 25 to 35, probably that's how old mm -hmm. millennials are. Typically mm -hmm. generation Z is the one that's growing up purely with social media. So millennials were kind of dosed with it once they were in middle school or high school. Mm -hmm. But now the kids growing up thinking it's normal from like kindergarten onward that's that's problematic but this gene's book is really cool because it talks about the fact that kids spend less time at the mall they go out less mm -hmm. they are doing less face-to-face -face time in many cases than previous generations so the way i see it impact we know we know that because studies have shown that with facebook it can really really up people's cognitive distortions and negative uh, self-evaluation. So in terms of social psychology, we would call that upward social comparison, right? You think, but here's the problem. It's not even a legitimate form of that mm -hmm. because you're comparing it to people's lives that are curated. And even though we know that when we're curating, so when we're carefully constructing our best moments on social media and uploading them, we don't account for the fact always that others are doing that too. We believe that they really are living their best lives. Mm -hmm. So we will evaluate negatively based on that. We will do a lot of social comparison. That's, that's problematic on that front. So that's just on an ideological cognitive distortion front. But when it comes to imagery and like Instagram and other forms like that, learning to brush away any imperfections, learning that all that matters is getting a snapshot. I mean, you see these, and I'm not picking on Instagram because I think it can be a great tool for marketing positive stuff as well. A lot of people who are in the space that we are for motivation stuff will post stuff there, just like any of these. But you see, here's where the problem lies on a, a level that is a little more difficult to talk about. The, the, deterioration of empathy. So you'll see these posts on Twitter, you'll see pictures of like teenagers who are posing for like a duck face selfie at a Holocaust memorial or at a funeral. Mm, and I'm yeah. not making this up. Yeah, I promise. Poor taste. It is poor taste. But when you have the exposure that you take these pictures everywhere, when you're exposed mm -hmm. to that narrative, you don't learn proper taste. It becomes a real, it, that's a real issue. So we have to step in and say, well, this is, yes, this is an event in your life, but you're sharing it with someone who's deceased or with right. millions of people who are deceased. This is where proper engagement with that content ends and begins. It's not about your makeup or picture that day. It's about taking that in on a, on a deeper level. So that leads to another issue with social media is very surface level engagement. Everything is more breadth than depth. So for someone like you and Kelly, so so for both of you, you will use the breadth of these platforms 
to share your deep message. Mm -hmm. That's ideal. But sometimes people will just share a selfie across them or share this Mm -hmm. or share whatever their mood is. And it prompts this hyper focus and hyper narcissism that is difficult because it's a chicken or the egg thing. It's like when you're exposed to that and you have a tinge of narcissism, it will explode that and then reinforce it. But even those who aren't innately highly narcissistic will be reinforced for that little kernel of narcissism. So that's it, it's, it's a real issue. And I think people are now starting to get kind of the whiplash from it. And I mean, obviously that book that was written, iGen is really good. Um, people are writing about how there's this fickle, there's, there's, a, there's a profusion of different ego states online. People are fragmented. We have different personalities and that's considered normal. Like you're you remember how you, when you growing up, did you ever hear your mom talk in a phone voice? Yes. Or have a different. Oh, sure. yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Right. But that was the phone, and that was one thing, and that was dip. Like we still have. So Irving Goffman would talk about front stage, backstage, right? Or was that cool? I think yeah, that was Goffman. So he would talk about, and this was this was I, over fifty years ago. Obviously, we didn't have the same stuff, but it would be like how you are in public, how you are in private, whatever. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of that now because there's different forms of public and private. It, nothing's really that private. So mm-hmm. we're in this phase of history that many are deeming meta modernity or like post post modernism, where we're assuming these fragmented identities and they're a part of us. And it's like for as a therapist who specializes in ego state work, so the different states of mind, like uh, the, the younger child self, which is really just neural networks and res- emotional responses that come from earlier in life. Looking at how there's different forms of these being fostered online now too, we have to unite the persona and not allow this to get out of hand and be defined by surface level states, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's so much there. If you could maybe kind of distill this down into a tip or a couple of tips for our listeners specifically on social media. So let's say there's some listeners who, who aren't using social media as a kind of a business platform. What are some things that they can do or sort of what's like a mental filter or a check that they can run as they're looking at social media, as they're a consumer? So that's a great point. One of the biggest things that you can do is be intentional with your time on social media, look at what you're actually trying to accomplish. What are you looking at it for? It's like, okay, I want to stay in touch with my friends. Great. Make sure to look at that and just temper that with the fact that this is just kind of their best stuff. So a lot of it would be what we do with clients in real life with cognitive restructuring and being aware of distortions just that that ability to meta cog uh cognate so so thinking about thinking metacognition so what are you thinking when you're looking at the social media th- thread this this uh, feed what are you feeling okay what are you feeling in your body is it is it feeding into an urge to prove yourself if so then that's some insecure attachment stuff we could get into attachment psychology and social media for a while but we'll keep it to some tips here. Um, Another tip is going to be what I found very helpful on Twitter, particularly create lists for different people that you want to follow. So health, um, physical health, maybe um, motivation, things like that. Be aware, set a timer for your social media engagement. Uh, Again, that sounds very cold and very calculated, but sometimes we have to to inject that element or we will, the time will get away from us. It's the same with YouTube. So I talk to clients about this a lot. YouTube videos are like potato chips. It's like one and then one and then one, and you can easily get sucked down that rabbit hole. I've done it before with clinical videos. Like I'll watch one, I'll leave stuff on the background. I'll get, you know, watch Bessel van der Kolk, his stuff's on YouTube. Um, that's a little less bite size and more lecture format, but there's, it's very easy to get into this and get sucked down the rabbit hole. It's created that way. So take ownership of that, set some limits, don't autoplay. Same thing with Facebook, get on there, post what you want to. Instagram, post what you would like to. Interact with somebody, be intentional about it. Every five minutes, check in. Um, 
again, notice what you're using it for. Do you feel the urge to argue on there? Because people will get into some arguments who are very high profile, people who um, have good education. Like there's that limbic system response. Recognize that people on social media are criticizing a conception of you, a flimsy two-dimensional model that isn't you. Don't allow your ego to be so infused in social media that you become argumentative that's a tough it's a tough lesson because our brains are still wired to take take anything that's insulted about us as personal we're not yet evolved to that i mean that's that's an understatement but notice if you're becoming emotionally fused with your social media versus using it as a tool I think that's really critical. I, I, I feel like, um, and because admittedly I'm on all the social media platforms because of my business, I have to set limits for the ones that I, I don't enjoy interacting on because it's such a time suck. Sure. Um, the irony is, uh, and I'm completely, I talk about this very openly, my preference is Twitter because you can get on, you can digest with the content that's on there and you can get back off. I mean, you could also get sucked in, but I also think it's really critical, you know, much to your point, we have control over what we choose to follow and what we choose to comment on. And so people that don't resonate or that, you know, their value system is very different than my own or, or people that I work with, I just say, you know, you can either block, you can mute or you can delete. I mean, that's the easiest point. It's like, you don't have to interact if you choose not to. Right. A hundred percent. And it's a tough thing to learn, but it's the same as setting boundaries with mm -hmm. toxic people in the mm -hmm. real world. And it involves not going back to that and, and developing alternative behaviors when feeling the urge to go back to that. Yeah. It's just really being intentional. It seems like that's the message again and again, just being intentional and conscious of what you're doing. Absolutely. And again, the systems are set up in such a way that it makes unconscious engagement very easy. So we have to temper that with our own conscious uh, engagement. So here's the here's the thing. There's also some apps out there that will help you limit your screen time or schedule your tweets or so many things like that. I don't have any off the top right now. Actually, oh, there's one I'm going to interview on my show, this guy that does one that's like called Hype Space or something. It's going to be a Twitter... Uh, I'll, I'll have more on that, but um, there's there's some some apps really help with Twitter and with time management on that stuff. So that's really exciting. Now, just out of curiosity, you, know, you mentioned in an earlier comment about narcissistic tendencies. What actually fuels that? I'm just purely asking for my own. I'm, I'm not going to refer to any political people right now, but yeah, uh, what what actually fuels the development of that personality disorder? How does that start stem? That is a great question. Uh, one of the bigger things that does it, and I'll let Kelly, obviously, she's going to have some stuff to share about it too. But one of the big points is how your parent related to you. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of an understatement. Um, Hype Fury, that's what it is, at Hype Fury. That's uh, going to be a Twitter growth tool. But So I, I wanted to look that up. Sammy Dindane does that. So anyway, um, so that's out there for helping time management stuff. Um, so getting back to narcissism. So uh, a great author for that is going to be Nancy McWilliams with her psychoanalytic diagnostic manual, her psychoanalytic diagnosis. She's amazing. Oh my God. She distills the psychoanalytic stuff in such an absolutely understandable capacity. And it doesn't sacrifice any of the complexity, which is a, a hard task for sure. But I went to a lecture of hers on narcissism and if a parent, it can go one of two ways, okay? So if a parent builds you up as infallible and that imperfection is not within your DNA or is unacceptable, then that really has a high correlation with narcissism. Okay. okay. Or if you see a parent fail or be too undependable, that can cause you to develop a sort of pathological independence that leads to narcissism. So there's kind of two routes there, which dovetails with what a lot of clinical wisdom would say. The bigger one that I focus on, like if, if a, the, the bit, one that's really relevant now is the narrative of telling your kid like that they're perfect no matter what. You tell them that they're worthy and worthwhile no matter what, right? If they have 
natural talents toward one area and not in another. And they don't think they have to develop those talents in another. And they think that, you know, getting an F in history is fine because they do well in math and that that's not a big issue. It's like, well, no, you may have some issues with verbal skills and that's okay. You're still worth, worthwhile and acceptable, but perfection mm-hmm. is kind of the kryptonite to healthy self-esteem that creates narcissism because imperfection becomes so anathema, so antithetical to the self, so loathsome that you can never admit fault. What do you what think? He, what he said. Yeah, that, <laughs> all of that. So good. So good. And clearly we could talk to you for hours down all of these different tangents and important rabbit holes. Yeah, I appreciate um, it. yeah. And I know I sort of forced you earlier into some tips about social media, but I would love for you to give our listeners two tips in general for things that they can do to improve their health and wellness every day. Mm, That's, that's great. Um, So the first tip is going to be engage in just even 30 second to a minute mindfulness a day that's focused on your body and your breathing, how you feel in the body. So Ariel Schwartz, my mentor, and Barb Mayberger, her her co-author, wrote EMDR Therapy and Somatic Psychology, an amazing book that gets into how the body affects the brain. So take some time to check in and do that every day with your, take some time to be mindful of your body. Another thing would be have one small goal that you want to accomplish that day, very small and, and check that off at the end of the day because people spend so much time on these big goals and without breaking them down into larger ones that it can become burdensome and they think, oh, I failed on this. No, take a, like have a paragraph for your blog be the goal of the day versus finishing the blog. You'll get done with it quicker than if you say, I want to write all this blog in one day, right? Like that's why Twitter can be so helpful is it's like micro blogging. So yeah. people who <laughs> want to procrastinate and get it just right can get on there and do that and spit out stream of consciousness. You only have so many characters, right? Restriction can be very, uh, very cathartic and helpful to creativity. Like when Van Gogh did his blue phase, right? Or was no yellow phase. And like Picasso had a blue phase. That's what I was thinking of. It's like restricting yourself makes you work within boundaries and it can lift procrastination. So I would say check in with your body and do what works to help Get, go against procrastination because we have so much information overload each day. It can be difficult to sift through it and get toward our own goals. We can keep researching before writing. That's a, that's a real pitfall. Absolutely. Well, Jeremy, obviously we're going to have to have you come back because we could talk to you for hours, but thank you so much for your time. I know you're super, super busy and um, we just really appreciate you carving time out of your busy schedule to, to connect with us. Well, thank you. And people can always reach me on Twitter at uh, Fox Therapy LLC is my at, I think. Should probably have that memorized. But <laughs> I just looked you up. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Well, that's yes. Um, yeah, Fox at Fox Den. Therapy LLC. I do have it memorized. So Jeremy Fox, you can search me on Twitter. You can find me at Fox Therapy LLC, obviously LLC for, for business uh, abbreviation there. Um, you people can email me at fox what is it uh, fox emdr therapy at gmail.com uh, I, I am doing a podcast called the fox den uh, really excited to be doing that uh, people can always outreach me with questions I'm really getting private practice stuff up and going here want to do some talks some we're probably going to get a conference together which Cynthia, I t- mentioned you and Kelly, obviously, um, uh, of people who are really qualified in their fields, like a collaborative webinar thing people can pay for. Um, that's, awesome. that's a big project I'd cool. love to get going. Yeah, no, that sounds fantastic. Well, definitely check out your podcast and your Twitter account for sure. He's always offering up really high quality content. And again, we're grateful that you were able to carve time, time, bleh, time out of your busy Friday to Thank connect you. with us. Thanks for listening to Everyday Wellness. If you loved this episode, please leave us a rating and review. Subscribe and remember, tell a friend. And if you want to connect with us online, visit the link in the show notes.